G'day Wendy, we're back. Happy New Year to uh, everybody. Looking forward to a great big show tonight. Lots and lots happening, lots of things are uh, coming up for the new year. G'day Stan, howdy the coffee bush kid. G'day Crucifer. How you doing Brett? Walter. G'day Michael. Well, welcome to the Mind Lab Show, Australia's most informative and prospecting live stream in Australia. This is a place where you're going to get all the tips, tricks and super deals you need for your next gold prospecting or treasure hunting adventure. In this episode, we're going to check out some of the coin and treasure discoveries from around the globe. Learn what life was about for women on the early Australian gold fields. We'll look at some innovative products that will make your trip more enjoyable. And of course, I will answer your questions live and give away a fantastic bit of kit to help you in the great outdoors. I'm Gold Digger Dave from Miners Den. Let's get digging. There's nothing like the sound of gold under the coil when I'm out there swinging my detector. There's nothing like the sound of gold under the coil when I'm out there swinging my detector. Okay, well look, uh, let's quickly check on the prospecting and treasure hunting news. Uh, firstly, we're going to have a look at the gold price. And with the start of 2022, what's likely to be in store for the gold price? So far, we can see that from the graph, the first 12 days of 2022 has seen the gold price continue to hover just above the 2500 mark Australian per ounce. Let's hope that this year we continue to see the steady increase in the gold price, but only time will tell. Now, of course, uh, a new year. We've got lots and lots planned for this year for you. Uh, we've got uh, some new segments coming up on the show. Uh, the Miners Den is going to launch some new certified training on a number of Mine Lab metal detectors. We're going to be running some new tours in the New South Wales and Victorian gold fields. Of course, we're the largest uh, attendee of any of the dealers to the caravan and camping, outdoors and 4x4 prospecting shows. We're going to be doing those again this year, COVID allowing, in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. So you'll see us at all of the uh, shows that we're close to and we'll be somewhere where you'll be able to get some service in the local area to where the show is. I don't see much point in coming along and doing shows uh, and just uh, handing over product, which I believe some dealers have some ideas that they're going to do in areas where they've not even got a store to be able to support those customers. So the, there you go. Lots of new products also coming up new videos to help you get the most out of your gold and treasure hunting adventures. Now, kick it off for this year, we've got our first of our live weekly viewer giveaways. Now this week, we've got a 950 gram bag of Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt and a Mine Lab Pro Gold Panning Kit. So that makes up a fantastic viewer giveaway prize. And as usual, we're going to do one for Facebook and one for YouTube. Every bag of Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt contains some gold. There's also rich mini patches with some random bags having up to one ounce of uh, gold in patches. It's a great way to hone your panning skills while you're at home so that when you get out in the bush, you really do know what you're doing and you're going to get the most out of your gold panning experience. Australia's richest pay dirt from the Golden Triangle in Victoria. To put simply in this comment into the feed or ask a question. Just let us know that you're watching uh, and you'll be in the running to 
win these great prizes. I'll check out some of the great discoveries from Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt a little later in the show. Okay, next coming up we have, uh, uh, going to learn a little bit more about Sarah Davenport in our Gals on the Goldfield with Rhonda. Let's have a look about Sarah's life. Hi, I'm Rhonda back with another Gals on the Goldfields. This Gals on the Goldfield is all about the historical records of the Gold Rush era. In particular, the first-hand diary accounts written by women. As we know, women weren't encouraged to write about their experiences, but luckily for us, one of them did. Sarah Davenport. She recorded her life prior to and during the Gold Rush period. But what makes Sarah's diary different is that she wasn't a very well-educated person. So we get to hear firsthand what life on the Goldfields was like for a poor working woman. Sarah and her family came to Australia because they needed a fresh start. Like many others at the time, Sarah and her husband Samuel hoped that by coming to Australia, they might better themselves. Sarah was 31 and the mother of three children. Now the trip to Australia didn't start well. When the ship they boarded in England got stuck on a sandbar just out of Liverpool, they lost most of their belongings and they were lucky not to lose their lives. After borrowing money from her parents, they set sail again, only to lose their baby on the voyage. Once they arrived in Australia, things were far from great for them and their life was no better than what it was back in England. Her husband didn't have much work and with the birth of another son, they were very, very poor. So Sarah started taking in washing in order for them to survive. When gold was discovered, Samuel and the two eldest boys went to Ballarat to try their luck. They had some success, but Samuel's health wasn't good, so he asked Sarah to please come and help him. Sarah describes the life on the early diggings as being rough and hazardous, with many ruffians that drank and fought each other. Her husband was a bit of a no-hoper, not up to doing the hard work of digging. He was always lurching around from one money-losing scheme to another. And then when word came through about the new find at Mount Alexander, Sarah and her husband went in shares with some dubious characters to buy a horse and dray to move to the new field. Now, the men tried to cheat them, refusing to put their things onto the cart. Samuel was very nervous and didn't stand up to them. But Sarah saw red. She grabbed a shovel and shouted, I bought the horse and if you don't take my things, I will just break one of his legs. They found room on that dray after all. When they arrived at the diggings, Sarah said the gold was plentiful with much of it on the surface. She and another woman paired up to prospect together. They set out looking around the hills with just a knife and a tin plate. They had lucked upon what Sarah describes as a patch of surface. So they got a tub, a pick and a spade. When the tub was full, they carried it down to the creek, washed it in a bucket and then finished it off in a tin dish. Sarah reported that the first tub full yielded about three ounces and the next tub full four. Over the next coming days, Sarah worked alongside her husband and her young sons. Samuel was weak and couldn't do much digging, so Sarah had to do the bulk of the hard work. They averaged about eight ounces a day, washing gold this time instead of washing clothes to support her family. All the miners on the gold fields were required to have a gold licence. At the time they were really expensive, one pound for a month's licence. One day when Sarah was washing gold, troopers came along and demanded to see her licence. She didn't have one, but her husband did. Now Sarah was smart and wasn't intimidated by the troopers. Instead, she argued with them. You see, in the mid 19th century, a woman, a married woman had no separate legal status from her husband and Sarah used this argument to her advantage. My husband's got a license and the parson made us one and he'll be here soon to show you. You must have one, they said. To which Sarah replied, the parson made us one, are you going to divide us? They couldn't argue with such logic and rode off laughing. Not long after this, Samuel decided that he wanted to leave the diggings and go back to the city. They had over 80 ounces for their first time on the gold fields. Sarah said that she wanted to stay longer but was forced to do what her husband wanted. And against Sarah's advice, 
Her husband used their savings to buy a horse and a block of land on Collingwood Flat. It was a scam and he lost most of her hard-earned money. Through her diary, we are left with an incredible record of life on the diggings for a woman and her family. Sarah was a strong, determined woman who met life's challenges with courage, persistence and above all, a great sense of humour. Thanks for watching my gals on the goldfields. See you next time for another segment. Okay, now look in a story that uh, has come out of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo recently, a gold rich mountain has been discovered. Now this is in our new gold story segment. Um, this is causing a major rush with the surface soil reportedly 60 to 90% pure gold. Local villagers could be, could be seen using shovels and even their bare hands to collect the rich pay dirt which they would bring back to the homes in the nearby villages where they would wash the soil and extract the gold. The influx of diggers flooding into the surrounding villages to join the mad scramble for gold has caused the local authorities to ban all mining activities in an effort to ease pressure on the local resources. Look, it's a story most gold prospectors can only dream about. If you want to learn more, Check the link in the feed after the show. Okay, moving right along from our gold story, uh, but we're going to have a look at some of our uh, great store offers that we've got happening at the moment. And uh, of course, the first one we're going to kick off is with a new series of uh, maps. Now, I think I've got one of these down here somewhere. These are the signal, signal gold prospecting maps. So uh, there's one on Bendigo Whipstick, there's Dalesford Barkstead, there's Molden Morong, Maryborough and Denali. St Arnold and Stuart Mill when we're to burn and wheeler. So you're getting a couple of areas on each one of these maps and on them what we're seeing is if you have a look at the map they're very detailed legend on them so it's showing the major highway, it's showing minor roads, it's showing four wheel drive and rough tracks, it's got train lines and stations, it's got virtually everything, water courses, um, uh, water areas, it's got the contours on, it's got all the parks and the conservation reserves, historic areas. Uh, of course it shows you on the map where prospecting is prohibited as well. Uh, different mine sites, major ones and minor ones, as well as the shallow workings and of course the surfaced areas on the map. So all the yellow on the map there you're finding is the, uh, the, the actual workings. There are some surfacing areas on some of these maps as well. There's a quartz reef, uh, both worked and unworked, and on top of that you'll also find there's uh, campgrounds, picnics and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, signal maps are uh, now uh, available on the website, minersden.com.au and uh, what we've been finding is people have been able to actually uh, compare these different maps and they're finding places that aren't on some of the other maps that are out there at the moment. So it is good when this new uh, information comes out. If you do your research properly, you can jump on, get into some spots that may not have been as prospected as heavily with uh, the facts they're not on the actual maps. Uh, so that's the Signal Gold prospecting maps available online and in store. Now, of course, we've also uh, been innovative in our Universal Bluetooth kit this year. So uh, Universal Bluetooth kit, uh, it fits any detector, including the SDC 2300. It's easy to set up. Uh, and the kit includes uh, the MindLab uh, Bluetooth headphones, but it also has um, uh, a transmitter if you have your own headphones as well. Uh, this uh, is the latest technology, so it's got no actual delay in the, um, in, the, in the sound that comes through to you. The kit uh, is available for about 265 bucks. You can see the, what we've got up there is the uh, transmitter only. The transmitter only comes with its three cables, so there's one to fit uh, the SDC, there's one to fit the quarter inch jack. There's also a charging cable, a little piece of Velcro in there to stick on the back to attach it to your machine. And we have also have an adapter that we throw in uh, if you need it to run these uh, units on your 
monsters, those things with a smaller pin on them. So uh, let's have a look at how this works now. So I've got one here, I've got uh, a little kit box here. Uh, this, uh, like I said, fits any detector. You've got your little transmitter here as well. I have the cable to fit the SDC and I've got an SDC in front of me here now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip up the little cover there. Of course, I'm going to put the plug on, so I've got a little lead here. If you squeeze that little lead in, or squeeze the little side bits in when you put it on, that'll make sure that you're not going to do any damage to the, the plug when you're pulling it on and off. I'm going to slide the cable now back underneath the cover here, and it should come out this other side in a second, I hope. Let's have a look and see where that's gone there. Out it comes. Okay, I'm then going to plug it into the back of the uh, transmitter here. It's just a little uh, plug that goes in, slot it in. Stick it on to your uh, detector, and if you're buying an SDC, the covers that we run here at uh, Miners 10 actually have the Velcro already on the cover for exactly this purpose. By pressing and releasing that button, we now have the blue light flashing. I've paired this set up before, so headphones on. It's that simple for you to have wireless freedom or wireless audio with uh, any detector using the Miner's Den Universal Bluetooth Kit. So that's a, a new innovation from us there. I'll just switch that one off there now. Just hold the button down. She goes red. It's all done there. Uh, that, again, is available online. So you can get that uh, in both the kit at 264 I think it is. And also, uh, you'll have uh, the option of buying a transmitter if you have your own low latency headphones. If you're using your own headphones, own wireless headphones, you need to make sure that uh, you have the make sure that you have those low latency ones because if you don't uh, you'll be limited and you'll actually get a, a bit of lag in it if you're not using proper low latency headphones. Of course the MindLab low latency headphones are using the latest Bluetooth technology uh, and they seem to have zero delay in them. Okay the last thing I wanted to talk about now is another one that we might need to look at uh, this time of year. What we've got here is our new snake guards. Now these things have come in. I'll just uh, unpack one there. So you get you get two snake guards in the um, in the in the kit. Uh, just open up one. Uh, nice and comfortable. They've actually got a rounded uh, shield in them, so it's not square and hard on your leg. Uh, lots of little bits around the edges here, so you can wrap it around uh, virtually any size leg. You've got to have a fairly big leg not to uh, get yourself into here. Uh, these also have no metal in them and they've got the buckles on the edge here and a little bit that goes over the top of your foot. Um, if a snake decides to bite you on the foot it's not going to usually get through the rubber on the bottom sole of your shoe and things like that but it may get through the top if you're wearing something like a sand shoe. So this enables it to protect it there and uh, can save you a lot of pain and stops you getting bitten by a snake. It's pretty apt time because uh, I've seen a couple of snakes out there lately. These uh, snake guards or gaiters are very, very effective in protecting your legs from a snake bite and there's lots of uh, them running around just at the moment. So you can see there it's got all double buckles and things on it as well. It's uh, the perfect thing for someone who's going out prospecting. You want to look after them, uh, make sure that they're safe out there. Grab yourself a set of these again. They're actually on the um, website as well, minusden.com.au, and we have them in all stores. So that's either in Adelaide, in our Melbourne store, our Bendigo store, and of course up there at our new store in Penrith. So that was uh, just a couple of quick things that we've uh, got coming out. We've got a whole range of new products coming out this year that are just going to make your life so much easier. So let's go back again now and I sort of pick up on uh, some pay dirt. We've had plenty of people who've uh, bought some Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt, uh, whether it be a bag or a combo with a panning kit and things like that. Uh, maybe they've bought a tub. Now look, uh, they've been under the crispered trees uh, for a lot of people lately and we know from the photos that we are seeing on our Facebook page that uh, it's always bringing plenty of joy uh, for the Christmas period. Check out this photo from one lucky punter who found an incredible 15.79 grams in a 950 bag of pay dirt. What a find! As I always say, this is no ordinary gravel. Every bag or tub is guaranteed to include some gold, which other bags, random bags, will also include rich patches 
and tradable or redeemable tokens. Of course, they're also collectible, the minus 10 tokens, and there's a gold one, a silver one, and a bronze one. Now, the gold one's real gold plated, and the silver one's real silver plating on the actual token there. Uh, you get uh, 25 bucks off when you buy, uh, spend 50 or more with the silver one, 10 bucks off uh, for the little bronze token, and you'll save uh, $50 when you use the gold token. So it's $50 when you spend $100 or more at Miner's Den. So our Facebook uh, competition is still running, so we've been running that with our pay dirt uh, throughout last year. And I'd like to congratulate Damien Herter, who won our December competition, and he'll receive a $50 gift card to spend at any of the Miner's Den stores. Remember, the January competition's open now, and it's really easy to enter. Simply buy a bag or a combo pack of Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt. Maybe you bought the tub. Have fun. Pan it off and take an image of the results, including any tokens received, and post that to a pinned post we have on our Facebook page. Bingo. You're automatically then in the, with a chance of winning the Miner's Den $50 gift card. Once again, Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt is no ordinary gravel. Okay, next up we have um, uh, some coin and treasure uh, stuff coming up. Uh, let's have a look. Store offers have gone through there. I'm just uh, flipping over my notes to see where I'm at. Uh, we now have to have a look at the Gourmet Pay Dirt. So we've done that. That's all good. And the cop next coming up, we have the Coffee Bush Kid coming up, uh, and he's going to take us through the process of gridding. G'day, folks. I'm the Coffee Bush Kid, and today I'm going to answer a question that had been asked on the Mind Lab show of how far should I advance my coil with each swing? So we'll do a practical demonstration for you and show what, uh, what the theory should be. Well, we're using the 11 inch coil for this demonstration and you can see on the ground there that I've put two lines which is in fact the diameter of the coil. Now in theory, theory, you should potentially swing half a lap to one third of a lap further on from your last one. So if we were to do the half lap, you can see here we're swinging through it We've moved halfway, you can see it swinging along that line, and then on the next stroke, we've, we've advanced one coil's width with, uh, what was that, two, three, three swings. Again, if you want to be a little bit more thorough, and you want to do the one third swing, long there, one third, two thirds, and there's the full coil's width that we have now progressed. Doing that, you're going to pretty much cover all the ground, especially if you're keeping it, keeping the coil parallel to the surface of the ground. And that is good uh, advancement of your coil for your swings. Well, that was the in theory of how to advance your coil with every swing. But in practice, sometimes the area that you're detecting won't allow you to do that. Or there may in fact be time restraints where you just, you want to cover an amount of ground and doing it that way may well take too long. But do it where you can, like if you get a target, by all means, go really, really thorough. If you're just wandering and cherry picking and enjoying the day, yep, the swing pattern can be a little bit wider if you like, but be aware that you will miss some targets. I'm the Coffee Bush Kid, and that's been a quick tip for the Mind Lab Show. Oh, well, that got me a little bit rusty there. I got my uh, segment slightly out of uh, order there, which is uh, why I got a little bit lost. But we're now come back and we're going to have a look at our coin and treasure news. In this week's uh, coin and treasure news, we came across a fantastic story in the Daily Mail about a metal detectorist 
in the UK who discovered a 2,000 year old Roman bronze dice in a field in North Yorkshire. Using his trusty MindLab Equinox detector, Stephen Patterson initially thought he'd found a bolt, but after cleaning it up, he discovered it was an ancient dice and no ordinary one at that. It turned out that the find was what was known as a loaded dice, meaning it was slightly lopsided and when used, it favoured the number twos and the number sixes coming up more often. The Romans obviously used it to play a game that involved winning by betting on certain numbers coming up. And with this particular dice, those numbers were almost certainly two and six. Stephen lives in a part of England with several old Roman sites and loves uncovering ancient artifacts. He believes metal detecting is the closest thing to actual time travel. Well, that'd be a great little find. You're not going to see those uh, too often. So that's tonight's coin and treasure news. Next up, we're going to have another top tip and this time the coffee bush kid comes back and he's going to take us through the process of gridding. G'day folks, I'm the Coffee Bush Kid, and today we're going to talk about gridding. But first off, I want to give you a little history lesson. So, at home, I might have a book that I was given many years ago called Detectorists Through the Ages. Now, it has lots and lots of stories of the old detectorists of times gone past, like Genghis Khan. Uh, Alexander the Great, who of course his real title was Alexander the Great Detectorist, but because it was, just took so long to write and for printing costs at the time, they decided to shorten it. But he financed many of his Mediterranean vacations through what he found under the coil. But today, I want to tell you about William Shakespeare. Now it's a little known historical fact that William Shakespeare was an absolute gun detectorist. So what happened was that on one Wednesday he was invited to a party at a local Lord's place on the outskirts of London. And while he was sipping a beverage, he happened to look across the fields and notice these earthworks. And he thought, boy, geez, I reckon that looks like it might be Roman. Just at that moment, the Lord walked past and he said, hey, mate, that field over there, has anyone detected that? And the Lord said, well, you know what? To my knowledge, no one has ever detected that yet. So he, William said to him, well, would it be okay if I had a bit of a swing over it? And the Lord said, yeah, go your hardest, mate. Why don't you come back on Saturday and give it a go? So oh, William was absolutely wrapped to the back teeth. Couldn't wait, so you know, the rest of the week dragged on. Finally, you know, Friday night, true detectorist, he couldn't sleep much. So he was up at Sparrow's Fart, poor old Anne was still in the cot snoring away. He's had his breakfast, he's sipping on his coffee and he's looking out the window and the sky's all overcast and broody with the day. And William was thinking about how he was going to attack the field, what he was going to do first. And as he looked out the window and pondered, he thought, to grid or not to grid? That is the question. And right at that moment, the big zipper in the sky opened up and it persistently bucketed down. And William thought, well, you know, I'm up already. I might as well make the day productive. So he penned a play. And you know what? For the life of me, I can't remember which one it was. But the same conundrum faces you and I when we get to a certain spot that we want to detect, should we grid? And that's today's segment. So the first thing we need to actually explain is what is gridding? Gridding is where we take a small section of ground, mark it out, you know, this tree, that tree, that stone, this stone, and we go over it thoroughly with the coil so we know that we've got good overlap on everything and we go in multiple directions. As it so happens, I have a piece, and, piece of paper and a texture that have been uh, put here. So if we mark an area 
that we think we're going to detect, what you should do is you have your coil swing overlapping, going all the way like that in the area that you have decided to detect. Then you should come the other way. And this is the same for going for gold as well. So not only do you do that, you should then also, if you're really, really keen, you detect over the other way with your coil overlapping each time. And once you've done that, you'll also then go the other way. Now, with your coil overlap, you can see from here, we've covered the ground fairly well. So that's only been the texture, but naturally enough, if you're using an 11 inch coil, you're going to get good ground coverage. That is what uh, gridding is. Now, when should you use it? When you decide to grid, you should really have already found a target in the area. Personally me, I would not just pull up at a spot and go, yep, this looks good, I'm going to grid it. Because there are just some spots that don't have any targets in them whatsoever. And there's, there's also uh, time factors involved. If you pull up at a park in a country town and you've only got a 20 minute stop, you should not grid the area. You should just start swinging with absolute wild abandon, picking out the spots where you really think that there will be something. The times that I would grid an area is of course, you get your first target and you go, yep, this is good. You start, if you like, mini gridding around that target to see if there is anything there. So you might start to go in, spread out from your, your find area. And if you don't find any more targets around it, you just keep going and searching for more. But if you were to find uh, two targets that were, let's say, half a metre apart, you sh or, or closer, you should really start to pay attention. So that would be when you either have your own markers, go find some stones, mark out tree areas, and do this type of of uh, swinging with your coil over that area to get the most targets out of the ground as you could. Now another thing that you should probably do is when gridding, don't, don't make a big area. Always have a small area so that you can fully concentrate. I would say three to four meters tops at a time. Right, so now I've, I've shown you how to grid and when you shouldn't potentially grid. Another little factor that you might like to keep in mind is, is it a public area that you're in? You may not want to grid and draw attention to yourself too much. Um, to be honest, I don't grid that way. I'll mark an area, go up and down at once. If I'm feeling good, I might come back another time, do it the opposite way, just to go over it and see what I may have missed. If you have a permission that no one is going to, you know, you could put stakes in and just leave them there and absolutely make sure that you've done that area to death, really to death. And, uh, you know, you, you don't have the, the mental constraints of is anyone else going to come and take your targets? Well, I hope that that has demystified when you should grid, when you shouldn't grid, and what gridding is all about. At the end of the day, with any luck, it will get more targets out of the ground for you. So, I'm the Coffee Bush Kid, and that is today's top tip for the Mind Lab Show.
Okay, now, I've just lost uh, my little uh, teleprompter there, but that's okay. It's uh, not going to bother me. I'm just going to have to add lib a little bit here. We're up to the product spotlight. Uh, product spotlight tonight is uh, our 4.5 kilo uh, tub of pay dirt. So that tub of pay dirt uh, is going to give you a guaranteed return of around about... 65 to 75 um, percent with the pay dirt there you'll find that uh, you're going to get a lot of pay dirt that you're going to be able to go through and you've got to pan it a couple of times so it's going to take you quite a while to go through that tub now the return is a guaranteed return on this uh, bucket uh, it's what we're focusing on tonight it's perfect for when you're not able to make it out into the gold fields and you're going to find that uh, one in 20 of these tubs so you get your guaranteed return but one in 20 of these tubs has a lot, lot more gold in it. So whether you get the lucky one, the lucky one in 20 uh, is another thing, but it is certainly a fantastic way to get a bulk lot of dirt and to learn how to pan correctly. And you can do, like I said, you can do the dirt a number of times there. So uh, with that, uh, it's always going to have the best pay dirt in Australia. It's Gold Digger Day's Gourmet Pay Dirt. As I've said before, it is no ordinary gravel. Now look, uh, next up, we've got a special presentation coming. We actually had access to a historic stable site. Now that historic stable site, we're actually able to prospect on there and uh, we did a few things a little bit different while we were out there. So, if we're going to have a look now at uh, the old stables diggings, and this will go for quite a while, but it was quite fun and uh, it, you'll see it worked okay for us. We're very happy to be out there with a coffee bush kid. Okay, well we're here today in a historic stables uh, and we're going to look for some coins and relics. Now we've got permission from the owners to dig up the grass, help it get a little bit further down, and then we're going to wander around with our Equinox 800 well, I think we'll probably use a six inch coil here, will we Andrew? I reckon the six inch will be the go, Dave. And I think we dig it all up, uh, take all the grass up, roll it up and put it aside first. Yes, yes. And then we'll detect it all in one hit and see what we can find. Yep, it'll be brilliant. Another signal in there. Yep, that's a uh, 11 to 13, two bars down. Okay, let's take it out. I'm just in there. That's the beauty with a six inch coil, you can just go bang, there it is. It's in there. It's in the pile here. Let's have a look. Ah, the scourge of all detectorists. Another piece of a ring pull. Once again, no ordinary ring pull. This is a historic ring pull. It's been there for a while. Part of it's actually uh, disappeared. We'll put that into the collection of stuff we've found and keep going. Another bit of rust. A little piece of uh, rusty iron again. So, so far, we said we're going to dig everything. Uh, so far, we've only come up with junk, but we've only just started. Let's keep going and see what else we can discover. Take that out gently. Yeah, beautiful. There we go. There you are. I can see something just to one moment. I don't, don't move anything, guys. Just don't move anything. Ah, bring the camera. Yep. Bring the camera over here. We Check are riding a winner. We've only just seen this come up out of the ground here. I'm going to point to it just on there. We can see this is our first target at our historic dig. Let's have a look. Do you have a do the honors there? <laughs> so. Oh, oh! A holy dollar! We have been stooged! That is what happens <laughs> when you try and call the target too early. Well, it looked right. It did look right, <laughs> didn't it? Right, again, we're just in there. Alright, let's take a little scoop out of here. Just gently come back from behind so I don't damage the target. And... There we go. This time we've... Oh! oh. We oh, have hit it now. We are riding a winner. We have hit the high time. 
That is our first two cent piece. How lucky are we? Well, we knew we'd be onto the money sooner or later, <laughs> and we've scored. Oh, yep, I see the there. little blighter. There we go. Another ring pull. We'll give you a complete tally when we get to the end of our digging. I reckon that's steel. Okay. We'll trust your better judgment and we'll leave that one behind. Well, there's one way they reckon you can do it, is it you can get a signal this way. Yep. And then when you turn side on, if it vanishes. It's uh, more likely to be on because yep. Reedy's getting a better reading on it. Yeah. Oh, that's a bit different. Oh, that sounds solid 34. That is very different. You can see the animation now. <laughs> and you can hear the difference in that target when we were hearing that. It was very high pitched. Seems big, but I think we've still got to take it out. Yep. Let's I reckon. Have a little scrape in around here. If you come in right on that mark and dig there. straight down. Yep. Go straight down, push it back down in there. Yep. Tip it out to the side there. There we go. There we go. Oh, what oh, are we looking at here? That is a corker. Wow. That is what a corker. Is it? That is a light fitting. So, the shade of the light, more than likely hanging from upside down would have been kept in there by these little screws. Wow, it's not often you get a, a relic like this uh, that's there. A, that's an absolute ball And that probably looks like it might have been, it feels a bit of waves, it made maybe a brass, does it yep. look like? cast brass. Ah, Got really? a thread in the centre as well. Beautiful detail, even with uh, slight flat knurling on the edges of the screws. That's an absolute it's brilliant find. Well, we knew if we kept digging here, the history was here, somebody had to leave us something behind, and we'll clean this up a little later and uh, we'll show you everything we've found. But for now, we're gonna continue the dig. You're not gonna believe this. We've been digging under the ground and looking for uh, coins that are buried with our Equinox 800. But what have we got here, Andrew? Well, on the surface, Beautiful, 26, 27. And we're going to look down and we're going to see this is sitting right here on the surface here. <coughs> uh, we've just lifted up the grass and this one's uh, poking its head through. Let's have a look and see what we've got here. There we go. That will be a sixpence. It's beautifully worn. <coughs> 19, even with my eyesight, I can see that. 1917. 1917, a sixpence there. Okay, we have finally cracked it for a pre-decimal coin. What a find. We know there's gonna be another one or two here. We'll get this cleaned up and we'll uh, take a look at all our things a little later. Now you can see as we're going along here, Andrew's covering every bit of the ground to try and make sure we can pick out as many good targets as we can. There has been a little bit of junk in here and we've had to leave some behind, but the six inch coil is really doing the job in this tight area. Let's have a look. Do you want me to see. take you want me to tell you it's gold in colour? I would love to see. Look, let's just have a look at the little bit of sparkle that we can see under here. Look at this. Anyone would be stoked if they didn't <laughs> know that this is another wah, 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 wah. ring pull. Still. It's a nice gold one. It's a lovely gold ring pull. If it was solid gold, we'd be really pleased. But we're just happy to clean up the area <laughs> we're working in. Let's get digging again, Andrew. <laughs> Well, Andrew, that's been a great day out in the sun. And as well as getting all this junk, we found a few interesting bits and pieces as well. Let's have a look at those now. We found some, uh, we found some little jewels in amongst all the trash. And mind you, we did dig a lot and we left some in the ground as well. But of our best finds that really screamed, dig me, we got 
uh, what, what's there, five cents in one cent pieces? Yep. You won't often do that in a day. No, not but very often. Two cent piece, a 10 cent piece, a washer that looked like a coin when it was in the ground and did get us very excited. It did. But probably the jewel in the crown here is the 1917 sixpence. It's a little worn, it's a King George V, but by gee, we were happy to find it. In fact, Dave found it because it was sun baking. And took the grass off and there, there she it was. was. And then of course, we've got a couple of other little interesting tinkets here as well. So yes, we've got this piece that we think's out of, or that I think's out of a window, yep. something to do with the window. And probably the best, best relic of the whole lot would be this piece of cast brass from a from a, uh, a, a light ball. fitting. Yeah, a light. Yep. So, but uh, that's been a fantastic day. We've enjoyed it out in the sun. We've had lots of fun. Uh, we're going to put the grass back and take our few cents home with us. Well, that was a lot of fun. Uh, you just never know when you get into some of those sites what you'd be likely to do, and it was great uh, being out there with Andrew, whipping through that. Uh, we managed to put all of that grass back down after we'd done it, uh, laid it all back out and everything like that, and the grass is apparently growing back now, and uh, everybody is very happy. So moving right along, we're having a look at our questions for this evening, and again, I've got a fantastic question that came from uh, Guy Hamilton again. Uh, look, uh, Guy's question is, what would a smartwatch have a similar effects on a detector in the same way as uh, it is advised to set your mobile phone to aeroplane mode? Look, uh, it is a fantastic question, that, and I'd actually uh, sought some information from uh, the team at MindLab, and I learned a couple of things too. A smartwatch will interfere with your uh, detector almost exactly the same as what a mobile phone will. For that matter, anything with an active transmitter will interfere uh, with the detector also. So the guys at mine, they've uh, put me on to the bit about the smartwatch. I've actually been wearing mine around when I've been detecting, so maybe that's why I've found sometimes when I'm out it's a, it's a little bit noisy. Um, so uh, you can never stop learning uh, with these things uh, about the new technologies that my lab have and your prospecting and treasure hunting. So the good news is there's an easy fix to uh, either your smartphone or your uh, smartwatch. You can put them into aeroplane mode on the device. That'll turn the transmitters off uh, and therefore you won't get the interference. You can also put both the devices on to do not disturb and that will have the same effect uh, in being able to knock out the interference coming from the transmitters in your phone and in your watch. Now always remember that the more stable that you're able to run your machine, the easier it is for you to hear those faint targets. So faint targets are deeper or smaller and these are often, in my experience, been more likely to be uh, pieces of gold. So, turn off your uh, electronic devices when you're heading out prospecting. You'll reduce uh, the interference and your machine will run smoother. Thanks again for the question there, Guy. Now, the second question I've got up uh, is from Alan. And Alan's asking, what emergency communication equipment would you recommend for remote locations? Look, again, uh, if I was heading out, Alan, I'd be uh, looking at uh, taking some, if not uh, all of these things, depending on where I'm going. So the first one I'd be looking at would be an EPIRB. So an EPIRB is an emergency beacon that sends off a signal uh, to a tracking station. I think they track everything out of Canberra and the satellites pick up that signal and uh, they're able to then locate you and get you in. I think you have to have a couple of passes of the satellites and then the authorities will know that you're in trouble and they'll be able to come out and help you. So an EPIRB does have a little bit of maintenance with it over the years, but if you're heading out regularly into the, the great unknown or out to the great outback, you're going to find that an EPIRB will certainly be a good little asset. The other thing that uh, you could look at is a satellite phone or one of the combo cradles that can turn a standard mobile phone into a satellite phone. 
of course, I believe you can hire some sat phones from locations so that you can take them out and uh, that way uh, you've got communication almost any time uh, via that phone. I believe if you're sending text messages and things like that via the satellite phone, it's a lot, lot uh, cheaper than uh, making the calls on it, but you've got it there in emergencies if you need to make a call. Of course, you want to take your standard mobile phone also because uh, many of the mine sites in some of these remote areas uh, in West Australia and places like that, they actually have their own uh, cellular tower. So you, if you happen to be near some of those or working on the outskirts of uh, those on the exploration leases and you've got permission to do that, then you may get some uh, communications out from that uh, method also. Of course, having a two-way radio in your truck that's always uh, handy when you're heading out, uh, maybe have one you carry on you as well. Uh, if you're going out the way out, uh, that's a good way. There may be somebody who would also be able to pick you up on a two-way radio. Now, of course, uh, if you're really going into some stream areas and you want something that's just a last uh, resort to back up, maybe you could uh, take something like, and I wouldn't take these in every occasion because they're a little difficult to cart around, but maybe you could take something like uh, some flares that maybe alert some Somebody that you're in trouble or you're out in the bush somewhere or if it's night people can locate you a little bit easier with that as well. So that uh, would be the kind of things that I'd look at taking and that should keep you fairly well safe. Make sure you know how to use that equipment and do some test runs and practice with it prior to you heading into the, the sticks uh, and that way you'll know exactly what you've got to do there. Now look, I also got a question uh, this week from Robert, or these, some of these questions came in uh, last year. Uh, and Robert's question uh, is uh, all about charging the batteries and your detecting gear when you're out camping. Now Robert says there's a lot to charge nowadays, so you've got your phones, your lights, your headphones, torches, uh, detectors, and more. So what do you suggest as the better options? A 12 volt charging or inverters? Uh, and either a sine or a pure sine wave, or maybe generators. Well, look, uh, the 12 volt version of um, the charging systems are, are quite good. Mine, they provide you with the alligator leads for most, uh, most of their batteries now, or most of their metal detectors, so that you can just clip it straight onto a 12 volt battery. So if you're clipping it on straight onto a 12 volt battery, then what you'll find is um, you'll be able to charge off that battery and maybe top it up with a solar panel. If you're out back, uh, have a solar panel topping up the battery, uh, help keep it full, and then uh, obviously draw your power out of the battery with the alligator clips. Uh, if you're out for an extended trip and maybe there's no sun for a bit of time, then you can probably charge up your, your battery either from a generator or as you travel around. Now, if you're using a generator, you probably need to run that, as with the solar panel, into the battery and then charge from the battery. The reason for that is that lithium batteries quite often require constant power to, to get them charged up correctly. The power at, uh, output from a generator varies quite a bit and is not the most suitable thing. Also, obviously, you've got to cart fuel around for the generators. It's quite big to, to pack up and everything like that. Um, so uh, you could do it that way. Now, of course, an inverter is uh, another option, uh, but it probably depends a little bit too on what your setup is. Um, I haven't played around with inverters and things like that, but it would be a good option if you've already got one in your kit. It'd be quite easy to use your inverter and charge it up. That'll give you some uh, consistent uh, supply of power to help charge the battery. But I probably wouldn't go rushing out and buying an inverter for a thousand or whatever they cost, two thousand dollars just to charge up uh, a mine lap battery. You'd be much better off utilising a, a second battery, those kind of things, and you'd save a few dollars with your setup there. And there's obviously quite a few options for you to be able to uh, charge there. But my preferred one and the one that I've used before is using a solar panel into a battery, 12 volt battery, and then back out to charge uh, using the alligator clips. And that uh, doesn't take up a lot of room. Most people have got a spare battery. If they're going out in the bush, they'll have a spare battery in their truck anyway. So look, thanks again, guys, for the questions. That's really great. And look, don't forget, if you have a question, drop it into the feed. Corey goes through and has a look at those regularly when we're looking for our things that we can answer on the show for you. Also, we have our Saturday morning post that's all about questions just for me. 
So if you put the, the question in there, we mightn't get it up in the next episode, but certainly you'll see it come up uh, through the episodes there. And that goes up about 10 a.m. Uh, uh, Victorian or Australian Eastern Daylight Time uh, each week. So next, we're going to have now a look at the Wild West of Tasmania with a visit to Queenstown in this week's Gold Hotspot. Queenstown, located in the rugged mountainous west coast of Tasmania, was born when gold in decent quantity was first discovered in the area in 1881. Many diggers soon began to arrive in the hope of making their fortune, but getting there was extremely difficult, with the surrounding bush being so thick that it was almost impenetrable. But the lure of gold was a powerful motivator, and a shanty town originally called Pangana soon began to grow in the Queen River Valley. Within a couple of years, alluvial gold was found in creeks running into the nearby Linda Valley, and a 50 acre lease was pegged out around what would become known as the Iron Blow. There was plenty of gold to be found, but it was very fine, with some prospectors reporting that nearly a quarter of the gold was lost, washed straight off the end of their sluices. However, this didn't deter another significant rush, which eventually led to the formation of the Mount Lyle Gold Mining Company in the late 1880s. This company was eventually taken over by the Mount Lyle Mining and Railway Company, which soon began to mine one of the world's largest copper deposits. In the 1890s, the township of Pangana was burnt out and a new settlement renamed Queenstown was soon established further down the Queen River. Once a railway line was built connecting Queenstown to nearby Strawn in the Macquarie Harbour, the town boomed becoming for a time Tasmania's third largest town at the turn of the century. Hopeful diggers continued to prospect for gold in the creeks surrounding Queenstown, with significant finds discovered in Linda Creek, the Lake Margaret area and the Newell Creek area to name a few. According to the Apple Isle prospector, the Queenstown area today still offers some of the best alluvial gold prospecting to be found in Tasmania. He states that if you do your research and are prepared to get off the beaten track, you can get to a lot of creeks and rivers that haven't been overworked due to their remote location. On a recent trip to the Queenstown area, the Apple Isle prospector detected 20 grams of nuggets in four hours, with a further 30 grams found over the next couple of days. Queenstown today is well worth a visit, with its surrounding moonscape-like environment caused by copper mining and mass logging in the early 1900s, an incredible sight. The town is also on the edge of Tasmania's World Heritage Wilderness Area and is surrounded by lakes that are excellent for fishing. Queenstown is a two hour drive from Burnie on Tasmania's northwest coast and a three and a half hour drive from Hobart. Now look uh, as I said at the top of the show we've got a couple of fantastic giveaways one for YouTube and one for Facebook and it's time to uh, check out who the winners are so uh, just having a look here on Facebook we've got Cody Ann congratulations Cody Ann you've uh, scored yourself uh, a Gold Digger Dave's uh, Gourmet Bundle Pack there with the Mind Lab Pro Gold Panning Kit and a bag of Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt and on YouTube Ken Stewart Ken Stewart, you've also scored. So look, just let Corey know in the feed that um, you've uh, won there and we'll get those organised and get the prizes out to you. Um, so if you missed out tonight, get organised, be ready to jump in and get on board for more great prizes in the coming weeks. 
Uh, there's lots and lots of them coming up. We're giving one away each week to Facebook and YouTube. If you have some suggestions on what you'd like to see in reasonable price giveaways, please let us know. Unfortunately, I can't give away a 7,000 or things like that, and not even a 6,000. But there will be plenty of things for us to uh, get you out there and uh, learn a little bit more about the gold prospecting or treasure hunting. Now, come to that time again when we really do need to go. And look, this was a little bit rusty on our first show back for 2022, but uh, it's going to take a quick look now as what's coming up next week. So I'm going to find out what's happening in the uh, prospecting and treasure hunting news. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about uh, one of the fossicking or prospecting clubs that's around the uh, different states. Uh, we should be coming back with a quick tip or a top tip. We'll have the coffee bush kit as well, and I'll answer your questions. I'm Gold Digger Dave from Miner's Den, and you've been watching The Mine Lab Show. Thanks for watching. Remember, like, subscribe, and share. Tune in next week for another episode of The Mine Lab Show.